What is up, fellow thermonuclear AFers? I am Dan Pavali coming at you with a very cool mailbag while I am extremely uncaffeinated. If anyone's been following along, which is also probably why I've been, not been putting out as much content this week, I'm trying to do a seven-day caffeine cleanse because also anyone who listens knows that I consume probably, I don't want to say unsafe, but ungodly amounts of caffeine. I'm talking between like on average six and 800 milligrams a day, which is between six and eight cups of coffee. And that's down from like 10 to 12 cups of coffee worth. Fun fact, I do not actually drink coffee. I consume them via pre-workouts is the big one, but also just energy drinks, amino energy, and those go sour patch kids, energy drinks, sugar-free, by the way, only one gram of carb. Uh, those are addictive as hell, even the Swedish fish favor. So you should probably go check those out. Ghosts, come sponsor us. Why not? See, I'm already off the rails here. I am delirious. We have a mailbag. Very quickly, let me just remind you, implore you, beg with you, plead with you to subscribe to us wherever you are consuming us. If you're on YouTube, it means the world and helps us out a ton. If you hit that subscribe button, like, comment to help bust up the algorithm, make YouTube love us back. If you're listening to us via a podcast player, please consider throwing us that permanent subscription for whatever reason you've stumbled upon us here. If you've done all of these things, word of mouth goes a long way for us too. So tell people you know about the podcast, retweet our promos, tag us, or send the people links to our YouTube videos. However, you get word of mouth out for YouTube, but the retweets and telling people about us goes a long way. Also, join our Discord channel. Uh, we are comfortably above 100 members now. And the links to that are in the podcast description as well as the YouTube description. And follow us on all the socials. If you're watching, they're on the fucking screen. If you're not, they're also in the podcast description. They're also in the YouTube description as well. Whew. Let's dive into this mailbag. I'm trying to keep these briefer, these off-season podcasts. Shout out to everyone who's thanked me for making their off-season a little bit easier. I am here to give you all the incorrect takes possible. And I say this all the time, and I hope it doesn't dilute the meaning, but I appreciate every single listener that we get, especially the ones who engage or asking questions for these mailbags. It means a ton that I'm able to do two a week if I really want to, instead of doing a two hour mailbag where we sandwich them all into one. This one's going to be a mix of Twitter since we had so many questions. And then the other one will be our discord dominant. And I also have a couple questions on YouTube. We need to get to without further ado though, let's get something topical. This comes from Leland. He said, hey, I wanted to add to the thoughts of why the Celtics might trade Jalen Brown for Durant. You've covered most of it, but there's one other scenario that's most likely, but not, but very possible, and that the Celtics have an off year or disappoint. Brown could, keyword being could, possibly let it be known that he doesn't want to stay, and the Celtics might have to face trading Brown on an expiring contract, all of the Pacers and Paul George and Spurs and Kawhi Leonard. The, um, that value then as a rental would not help the Celtics get another top 10 to 15 player. Uh, I agree with this statement and this thought process. Uh, it rests on the fact that Brown, though, more than an off year next season, uh, you have to buy into whether you think that the Celtics run to the finals was was lucky or not, whether you buy into their midseason turnaround in full or not. The Celtics were a good basketball team, and they've gotten better just by adding Daniil Gallinari and Malcolm Brogdon. Maybe you account for some regression from Al Horford, but guys like Robert Williams the third. Uh, Grant Williams, they're only going to continue to improve. Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum are young enough to where they even might continue to improve. So I don't think that you make this call because you're worried about there being a regression. You make it because, one, it's fucking Kevin Durant. Uh, and there was that report from Adam Himmelsbach, I believe, that the Nets asked for both Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown in trade talks. I really hope that's fucking true just because I would love to think that Brad Stevens had to react to that or that there were people on the other end of the phone or the zoom call or whatever the text message, whatever the hell was happening that I actually had to digest what was happening there. Uh, but if you are worried that Brown is going to leave because we know we've talked about it on this podcast, he is not going to sign an extension. It doesn't behoove him to a uh, 120% raise off of his final salary. It doesn't even really get close enough to his max to justify it. He's better off waiting and hitting free agency in 2024 Maybe he signs a short-term deal to account for when the salary cap windfall actually comes, but he is going to wait. And so it will be shocking if he doesn't become an unrestricted free agent. And if he is given any inclination that he plans to leave or explore the market, yes, I do think that would incentivize the Celtics to go after Kevin Durant. And I, most of this stuff, it seems like is coming from the nets, but Boston is mentioned as one of the three teams with Toronto and Miami, who's most heavily involved. I think that more so speaks to where Durant either wants to go and there were reports that he has now views Boston as an actual destination per SNY's Ian Begley. 
Uh, and then there's also just the, the Nets know that a Boston package built around Jalen Brown, perhaps that drives up the offers of other teams that are in this, like the, the Phoenix Suns, or maybe if the Pelicans decide to get involved. That being said, I think from Boston's perspective, you have to kick the tires because it's Kevin Durant and he gives you basically everything of what you were missing when you're looking at the NBA finals. All of a sudden there's a trickle down effect where he's drawing most of the defensive focus. And maybe you're talking about, Oh, Jason Tatum was the best player in the NBA finals. Instead of KD is KD done. That discourse surrounded by Jalen and Tatum was just absolutely horrible. Jalen was better than Tatum statistically in the finals is Jalen as good in the finals, if Jason Tatum isn't the sole focus, not the sole, but the primary focus of Golden State's defense, no. And so people in the YouTube comments who were telling me that Jason Tatum is not a franchise player, um, I want to stop short of telling you to STFU, but like Jason Tatum is a franchise player. If you don't think he's top 10, that's fine. I'm not saying you have to think he's a top 10 player in the league. He's a superstar, though. So moving on from that. But yes, if the Celtics think that Jalen Brown is going to leave, that absolutely is an incentive to go harder after Kevin Durant, who's under contract for longer, even though you're giving up, you know, eight, nine years at this point, getting eight, nine years older, in addition to giving up other players. What does help, though, is it seems like Kevin Durant is trying to leverage um, on the Celtics' behalf by saying he wants to play with Marcus Smart. And so there needs to be more salary in this deal to make it work. It's not going to be Jason Tatum. It's not going to be Robert Williams III. Maybe the Nets ask about him, but I would be shocked if Boston acquiesced to that. If it was just RW3 and Brown, no draft equity, maybe. But if you also want draft equity on top of that, you're probably looking at, Derek White, or once he can be aggregated again, a Malcolm Brogdon. And so by Katie saying he wants to play with Smart, you're kind of ensuring that you don't have to give up Smart in that deal. I don't know that Kevin Durant's going to end up with the Celtics. They do feel like a more possible destination than they did at the beginning of this. My bet is still Phoenix or Miami, just because I think megastars tend to get where megastars want to go, and those were his first two options. Still, Leland, you're right. I, I think you hit it on the head that there might be more of an incentive for uh, Boston to be in this. Uh, if they don't think that Jalen Brown wants to stick around long term. And look, he should, he might be pissed off at this point because he kind of became, it was never actually sourced that the Celtics were shopping him in the middle of the year when they were struggling. But that was the, uh, I would call it the low hanging fruit discussion of, oh, should you break up the Jays? And if you're going to do that, you're trading Jalen Brown. And now you're actually being mentioned in trade rumors when you just made the finals and came within two victories of a title. So I could see why that would frustrate him. He's also one of the smartest players in the league. He understands that this is a business. Uh, if they're going to pay him max money or his market value when he hits free agency, I can't imagine you definitely need to worry about him being this massive flight risk. Harry asks, if the young guys on the Blazers really pop, and Anthony Simons, Nas Little used as examples, uh, Shaden Sharp, I think we could throw in there as well. What's their ceiling in the West? This is tough because I think even if we're assuming really good health from Dame, and Jeremy Grant and Nurkic, and you want to include leaps for Anthony Edwards and Nas Little. And look, Nas Little was very good before his injury. He brings like this just explosive energy to the table as a rebounder, um, a little bit of a multi-positional defender, a play finisher on offense closer to the basket. You're not going to trust his perimeter game just yet. And then Anthony Simons is just, I think he did a, a lot better as a playmaker last year and that he can lead some units on his own um, more than he could before. Uh, but his his crowning skill is just that off the dribble shooting. Uh, he is lights out when he's done that. And so I think that the Blazers at full strength are probably better than people think. They seem like they're set up to succeed defensively. Yeah, you're going to have to run some like base, maybe overly orthodox coverages with Nurkic in the middle. Uh, but that can work in drop coverage. Or you can get really creative and are you downsizing a little bit and you're trying out. Jeremy Grant at the five and you have Josh Hart and Gary Payton the second on the court with him, then Damian Lillard and Anthony Simons or Damian Lillard and someone else or Simons and, and someone else. So I think that this could be a better defensive team um, than people believe. And if you have Dame and I would say Anthony Simons at this point, if they're both healthy, you're probably looking at a top 10 offense. When you get into the Western conference though, if we're going to assume good health for the Blazers, let's do it for everyone else. Here are the teams that I do not think the Blazers have a chance of passing next year. Phoenix, Denver, the Clippers, and the Warriors. Those are the teams that I don't think they could pass. And so I will put their ceiling at fifth in the West. Now, if you're asking me whether I prefer the Pelicans or the Timberwolves to the Blazers, I probably prefer both teams at this point. Do I prefer the Grizzlies or the Blazers? It's close. The I'm way too low on the Grizzlies. I apologize, Memphis fans. Uh, do I prefer Dallas to the Blazers? I think I prefer the Blazers 
at this point. And so Sacramento or the Blazers, I think I give the Blazers the slight edge there as well. So a lot of things need to go right. And there are teams that I don't think they're going to pass. If everything goes according to plan or works out in Portland's favor, I don't think it's outside the realm of possibility that not only are they the a bona fide playoff team, but they're kind of comfortably in there as that top five spot. And if we're talking about the four teams I just named, Denver, Phoenix, Golden State, uh, and the Clippers as teams that, um, if there's a team that I think the Blazers could outperform, I honestly don't even know what it is. Like, I think people are probably too low on the Suns right now just because they didn't change anything up majorly yet this offseason. Kevin Durant, rumors pending, of course. Uh, Golden State, the fact that they're taking a lot of chances on their, or presumably going to take a lot of chances with their youth by maybe playing Wiseman, Kaminga, Moses, Moody more. Could they be a weaker regular season team? I don't know. I, I Like I said, I can't envision Portland passing any of those four teams. I think I'll just go with Denver or the Clippers because there's combustibility there with their injuries more so than there is in, in Golden State and you could or Phoenix. And you could say, oh, well, James Wiseman has been injured a ton. If James Wiseman's not playing, there's a chance that Golden State is actually better off just because there's a learning curve there for Wiseman since he's played so few NBA games. That's a great question, Harry. I don't know. I have to, you know, I'm saving this for when I really have to go on record with Bleacher Report, but also as we get into later podcasts in the offseason, as I try to make my record hierarchy, my championship hierarchy, uh, I don't know where I'm going to put the Blazers. They're, they're a tough cookie right up there with the Pelicans for me, and then I'm going to be absolutely just out of my mind when I get to the, the Eastern Conference. What do you think, Harry or Blazers fans? What is your... Let me know in the comments on YouTube or on Twitter what you think their ceiling is if they're going to be, or Discord, join our Discord, uh, what the Blazers' ceiling is if, if they're fully healthy all year. And I would, look, I think Anthony Simons is going to get even better, and I just, I don't trust Nas Little's health right now, and I'm very curious to see what the Blazers get from Shaden Sharp, assuming he's healthy and how much they play him. Uh, I'm just looking at the roster in totality and think that could be a fifth seed in the West if, if everything goes, goes right. Uh, Austin has three questions. Uh, I'm going to answer all of them. We discussed some of these on the side. Let's start with this one. What do you think the odds are of Benedict Matherin being rookie of the year, given his skill set and opportunity? I'm actually going to sandwich this with a, another question um, about my dark horses to win rookie of the year. That one came from Jake G as well. Let's just start with Benedict Matherin. Do I think he could win rookie of the year? There's going to be opportunity in Indiana. They're very clearly rebuilding and Tyrese Halliburton's kind of your one a at this point. And then everything feels wide open after that. When you're looking at the offensive pecking order, maybe you think Chris Duarte will get um, more touches, just being more established and definitely being older. I get that. I vibe that. Uh, that's it after that though. I mean, like you're, you don't have to allocate a certain number of touches to TJ McConnell or to Jalen Smith or to buddy healed. I mean, Smith and buddy healed specifically. And even miles Turner, those are going to be guys that play off the ball. And you look at the rest of this roster, like you're not going to have O'Shea Brissett on the ball a ton. You're not going to have, if you're even playing him, Aaron Neesmith on the ball a ton. And so Matherin, if we're really thinking about this should be no worse than the third option on the Pacers. And we know that there's a lot that goes into rookie of the year and the rookie of the year discussion this season included some really high level discourse, I thought. And so it will go beyond just usage, but if you're not having these dominant campaigns from the top three picks this year, which I'm not going to say you might not because they're all bigs, but you look at them and their offensive roles could be, I don't know, is it the word taint? Like restricted a little bit just based off the teams they're on and how offensive ecosystems tend to work. That might open the door for a lot of these guys outside the top three. And so I would throw Benedict Matherin up there. Uh, I'm without even looking at the betting odds for rookie of the year. If he's like a plus, like, you know, if he's 15 to one, Feels like that might be a fair return. Maybe that's even not giving him enough credit. Uh, looking at what he did in summer league, uh, the separation that he can create off the dribble, some of just the off the dribble looks that he hit from beyond the arc and his ability to score at all the different levels. I'm not sure. I definitely didn't understand, but I only get shin deep, uh, maybe knee deep into uh, draft coverage right ahead of it. Um, I didn't know that he was like such a, had such on ball upside. And that's clearly there. Um, just based off what I saw in summer league and going back and watching some of his college film, um, a lot of people thought he would be predominantly this off ball threat, but there's also like value in that. If you trust him to be um, and um, in motion away from the ball, how how's Rick Carlisle going to use him in, in that regard? I think he could play off Tyrese Halliburton really well. I think he can be in lineups. I don't know how it would look defensively, but if you want to play Duarte and Halliburton and Matherin at the same time, so that's going to help him. 
Um, I think the defensive role he plays, if they very much decide that, hey, we're going to slot you at the two and we're going to stack our minutes a ton, that could benefit him. But maybe there's also just like, oh, he's defending like more bigger wings than we thought he could, especially right off the bat. That could help him. Uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is like the highest range outcome for him feels a lot higher to me than it did when they they first drafted him. And it has nothing to do with the Pacers setup. Just it's off of watching him. And so I think he has as good a chance of anyone outside those top three players that we're going to gravitate, you know, Jabari Smith Jr., Chet Holmgren, and, and Paolo Bancaro. I think he has as good a chance of anyone. And the opportunity in Indiana, I think you can be ar- on offense, you can argue, is going to be greater than maybe even Bancaro gets in Orlando, certainly than Holmgren gets in Oklahoma City, probably. Uh, Jabari Smith Jr. in Houston, who knows? But so I think he has that going for him. A viable rookie of the year candidate. He would not be my pick at the moment, but I think... Would he be my top five? He'd definitely be my top seven, I think, at this point. Uh, I don't know if he would be in my top five. But you, if you put him in your top five, I wouldn't argue with you. Like, not even the slightest. Jake G asks, outside of the top three players, who is your dark horse candidate for rookie of the year? And so I tried to think really outside the box here, and I stipulated that I can't pick any of the top seven players. And I didn't even want to focus on like, oh, well, then I'll just default to like eight and we'll just go with Dyson Daniels and so on and so forth. I also don't know what Dyson Daniels opportunity is going to be like in in New Orleans. So uh, I I looked at Houston and I could see Terry Eason just based off what he could do as a wing and in heavy minutes that I assume that he'll get. Uh, I could see it being him. I could also see it if maybe Houston gets away from Kevin Porter Jr. a little bit. Do they move him? Do they try to make him just this specific microwave type scorer? Uh, where they don't task him with any facilitation duties. Do you get Ty Ty Washington in here? I think most people will push back against that. I could see one of those Houston guys sort of emerging here. My actual pick would be Jeremy Sowen uh, from the Spurs. Just a really smart player. And if he's going to be healthy, I think will already be a defensive disruptor. If the jump shot comes along, and now that Chip Anglin's not there anymore, maybe you don't think that's going to be the case. If he's better than expected as a jump shooter, uh, this is just someone that I think has a um, much higher 90th percentile, 99th percentile outcome than people even crediting right now. I don't think people believe that the the Spurs um, picked up this potential cornerstone. Um, and look, if I'm ranking the players that are most important to the Spurs' future, I think I might have Josh Primo ahead of him and maybe even Devin Vassell, but he's sort of right there. I, I think I would argue that um, Sohan's ceiling is higher than what we even have from Keldon Johnson, who just signed that four-year $80 million extension. And Keldon Johnson is really fucking good. So I'm going to go with Jeremy Sowan there. I don't know if he's going to make my actual like rookie of the year ladder when I do it, but I think that he's someone, if we're assuming that San Antonio is all in on this rebuild, they're going to give him some serious agency this year. And I think that that could then be parlayed into the counting stats that's necessary to get attention, but then also just the effectiveness to gain even more momentum from there. And people start to dig into you and see, oh, this is a really impact rookie who maybe is defending better than most other rookies. And maybe if they really dig deeper, they'll see that, oh, this is someone who makes really quick passes and he's not a ball stopper at all. And maybe they're running even some just standstill half court sets through him. So I'm excited to watch him play and not just because I I love his hair. Here's hoping that he uh, is healthy. I think he was dealing with a shoulder injury or something. Well, is it something was in the health and safety protocols? I don't know. It's all, it's all blurring together. Austin's next question. Do you think the Kings actually have a chance to slash will make the playoffs or at least the playing game this season? Uh, do I, yes, they have a chance. Am I going to pick them to be in the playoffs? No. Will I pick them to be in the plan. Probably not. I like let's what teams in the Western conference are worse than the Kings without beyond a shadow of a doubt right now. Utah, I feel like is going to get there. The Spurs want to be there. OKC could still be there. I think I would just keep an eye on OKC. They are, they might be just understatedly good here. That's three teams. And then Houston, I think you still put in there. So that's four, which look, now you're kind of looking at, so we have 12, 13, 14, and 15. You only need to beat out one other team then if you're the Kings to be in the play in. Here's the issue is that team Dallas, Denver, Golden State, the Clippers, the Lakers, the Grizzlies, the Timberwolves, the Pelicans. Like, it's really crowded in the Western Conference. The Blazers, the Suns, it's really crowded in the Western Conference. I don't think I'm going to pick the Kings as of now to make the play-in tournament. Um, I do think they've built a very interesting roster. I am all in on the Keegan Murray pick, um, especially as a fit. 
Um, I'm wondering how this team is going to carve out enough defense. As Matt Moore of Action Network did say, though, uh, there are worse models than De'Aaron Fox, Domas Sabonis, and, quote, fuck a fuck ton of shooting. I just, I'm looking at this roster, and it's okay. Like, Malik Monk is kind of exciting, and he's going to put some pressure on set defenses and drill a bunch of threes. Kevin Herter, another motion shooter. Uh, you have Harrison Barnes. Is, I guess you're him and Davion Mitchell, your best defenders. Does Keegan Murray work his way into that discussion? You need De'Aaron Fox to maybe have the best defensive season of his career. At this point, the roster's got like some depth to it. Again, especially on offense, just to have Rashawn Holmes as your backup five right now is beyond a luxury. And I would argue just a misallocation of assets, but I digress there. So uh, I don't think, I think it's very eminently possible that they make the play in tournament. I'm not going to pick them to win the play in tournament. And I'm not even sure that I'm going to pick them to be one of the top 10 teams in the West. Because as of right now, I only feel confident in saying, and I don't even feel 100% confident in this. But OKC, Utah, Houston, and San Antonio are the only teams that are going to definitively be worse than Sacramento next season. Final question from Austin. Uh, who are your some of your picks for first-time All-Stars this year? Mine would be De'Aaron Fox or Zion in the West. And in the East, I got Cade and bold pick John Collins. Uh, two things. I don't think John Collins is a bold pick. I think with DeJounte Murray and Trey Young there, and then you do have... Uh, Clint Capella eating up some of those minutes at the five to where Collins might be best suited on offense as the primary screener. I get that concern, uh, but that's a good pick. Zion also already made an all-star game, so I'm not going to include him in in mind. De'Aaron Fox is a good one. He's Look, he played like an all-star to close the season, and he's he's had half-season-long stretches, three-quarter season-long stretches where he's looked a part of an all-star, so it wouldn't shock me if he gets there. If I had to pick one from each conference, I really want to pick Tyrese Maxey, from the East, but as Austin and I were actually discussing, he put up wild numbers with James Harden and Joel Embiid last year, but do those sort of sustain? Um, I could see him working his way into the discussion, though. Kate Cunningham is, of course, a good one. I think Evan Mobley belongs in there. I'm going to go with Cade Cunningham, and I'll follow that up with, fuck it, let's be bold. I'm going to say Tyrese Maxey. Putting that over Scotty Barnes or Evan Mobley is probably stupid, but I'm just going to throw that out there. For the West... I'm going to just say Shea Gilders Alexander. I think this might be the third year in predicting his first all-star appearance. It's definitely the second one. Uh, that dude is just so good. And if they actually let him play uh, and he doesn't get injured and this granted, this isn't as big of an, I think he had an injury last year. So this isn't as big of an issue when you're looking at pre all-star break. Uh, now that they kind of have some, I don't know if they have enough floor balance around him, but they definitely have more weapons around him. I could see him being a little bit more efficient than he was this past year. It did seem like Oklahoma city sort of clunky setup. Uh, took its toll on his efficiency and, and his not overall production, but just his efficiency in the way he, his shot selection last year, I should say. So, uh, but Darren Fox is also a good one. I'm trying to think of if there's anyone else in the West that would just spring to mind for me. And I, I don't think there is right off the bat. Um, so yeah, I'm going with, so we're settling on Shea Gilles Alexander in the West and I'm going to go with Kate Cunningham in the Eastern conference with keep your eye on Scotty Barnes, Evan Mobley, I, look, Tyrese Maxey. I even think John Collins is probably a good one, but uh, those would be names to keep an eye on. And certainly out West, you have uh, De'Aaron Fox in there. And I don't, I honestly can't think of like someone else that would, like Jordan Poole is not going to crack that discussion this year for, for Golden State. Uh, I'm, I'm probably forgetting at least someone. Like would, could Anthony Simons maybe go kaboom? Is that someone we should really be, be watching as a first time All-Star? I can't get there at the moment. Uh, Michael Porter Jr.? If he's healthy and I'll get to him in, in sort of a, a second in something that's tangentially related to that. Uh, so those might be some other names just to keep an eye on. Great questions, Austin. And thank you for all of them. Uh, Cade asks, whom are you targeting in an NBA expansion draft? Just players in general or favorite starting five. This question, we had something similar a while back and I always put way too much thought into it because the expansion rules are so they're not complicated, but they make it hard to kind of, decide who would be available. Every team can protect up to eight players in an expansion draft. And uh, you kind of have to think through, okay, well, if you're going to the ninth best player in everyone's roster, this isn't going to be fun, but there are players who have contracts that would teams want to ditch or get rid of, uh, of course, Russell Westbrook, but like, so one of my picks in here that I think would be a surefire pick is a Mike Conley for me, just slotting him at point guard, do the jazz, do they think that they can get value from him on the trade market or because he's owed so much this year and then guaranteed almost 15 million in 23, 24 and they're rebuilding. Would they just make him available in an expansion draft rather than 
protect him. Uh, it's tough because like when you go eight deep on their roster, like yeah, Donovan Mitchell, Walker Kessler, uh, they're also going to have Jared Vanderbilt. They're probably protecting those guys over him. But do you like, are you still thinking that you can get value out of Mike Conley or just view him as a good salary matching tool? I'm going to pencil in Mike Conley here. Uh, I also have uh, Gordon Hayward as one. I think that the Hornets would probably want to get rid of his deal. Maybe not so much given that we don't know what's happening with Miles Bridges' future. But so I have him penciled in here as well. That is Gordon Hayward. The one I thought about, and I don't think they would do it, but if the Nuggets had the opportunity to just get off of Michael Porter Jr.'s money, would they unprotect him in an expansion draft rather than have that basically five-year max extension, which there there are some protections for them. There are partial guarantees on the back end. Uh, I don't think they would do it. So I'm not going to pick him, but he is someone I have in question marks on my sheet that I'm staring at right now. So, so far, I have Mike Conley and Gordon Hayward. Uh, this was interesting. I have Kevon Looney as my center because when you start to look at it for Golden State, if they can protect up to eight players, they're going to have to use every one of those protections. I'm saying definitely Steph, Clay, Wiggins, and Draymond. That's four. You definitely protect Kaminga and Poole. That's five and six. I'm assuming you protect Wiseman. You don't just leave him unprotected in expansion draft. That's seven. And so are you protecting Moses Moody or Kavon Looney there? I don't know. Maybe you're protecting uh, Looney, but I'm picking Kav- uh, I'm picking Kavon Looney because I think he'd be the one that they'd be more inclined just to protect the wing rather than the big. So I have Kavon Looney, Gordon Hayward, and Mike Conley right now. Uh, I thought about Tobias Harris here, but I don't need to go that much all offense. I think I'm going to go with, I'm assuming Marcus Moore Sr. wouldn't be protected by the Clippers. Maybe I'm wrong there, but they have all the wings, and I think they should open up playing time for Amir Coffey. Um, and then I'm I'm kind of torn between Eric Gordon or Josh Richardson. Give me whoever is less likely to be protected by their team. I think for my roster, Josh Richardson might make more sense. At the same time, having the extra element of shot creation from Eric Gordon. So I'm going to go Mike Conley, Eric Gordon, Gordon Hayward, Marcus Moore Sr., and Kavon Looney. I gave, I really thought maybe I should figure out a way to get Kenrich Williams in here. If I could have him over Gordon or Richardson, that like two spot, even though Kenrich Williams isn't a two, that's what's tough for me. And maybe if you think that Gordon's going to be protected, I think OKC, there's a chance they protect Kenrich Williams, but they also have enough youngsters on the roster that you could get eight deep pretty quickly. So I'm probably at Mike Conley and then Eric Gordon or Kenrich Williams, Marcus Moore, senior Gordon Hayward and and Kevon Looney. That's a fascinating question. Cade. Uh, Let me know anyone what their expansion would be. And I'll let you know whether I think those players would be protected. Do you think that I chose anyone that would be, uh, protected in an expansion draft as well. The Michael Porter Jr. question to me is fascinating. Maybe a little bit less so now that we're closer to the season. And it's like, oh, he's going to be healthy. Jamal Murray's healthy. They added Bruce Brown and KCP. Like, this is the year that the Nuggets are are going for it. Caden asks, with KD reiterating that the Nets need to choose him or the franchise leadership, Nash and Marks, it seems like KD will be traded. If, when this trade happens, what should the Nets do, not this year, but the following year in 23-24? Go tank mode or push for the playoffs with Simmons? So, they should not go tank mode because they owe their um, 2024 draft pick outright to Houston this year. I think you tank because, and I know this wasn't your question, but just to get that on the record, you tank this year because it's a swap with Houston and Houston should still be pretty bad. Um, So even if you have the worst record, you're still looking at getting a high lottery pick next year though. Your first round pick is owed to Houston free and clear. I don't think you tank on purpose. With that said, I liked what the Nets did when they were first taken over by Marks. They decided those picks were out the window. They were going to build their roster how they see fit. They weren't going to make these short-sighted win-now moves to just um, ensure that the picks they were sending to Boston were a little bit less valuable. So I could see them sort of pivoting to the all-in youth movement anyway if that's the route they decide to go. Given that what we've heard about the Durant return, that they are sort of focusing on a player as a centerpiece rather than just all the picks. And it seems like they want players and picks. We'll see what they wind up settling for. I think what you do is you try and go for it around Ben Simmons. I don't think you do anything to short circuit your future, go spend on dumb free agents and sign in trades or, or make these um, other trades where whatever draft equity you're getting from Kyrie Irving and Kevin Durant trades, you're then flipping for like mediocre players like a Gordon Hayward. But look, if you want to keep Royce O'Neal, if you want to keep Seth Curry and put them around Ben Simmons, you want to keep Joe Harris. I don't think it needs to be a full-on sell-off in large part because, look, yeah, do the one-year tank, but in large part because I don't know that you're 
uh, good enough anyway for it to matter. But it's mostly just that you already owe your 24 pick to Houston outright. So tanking doesn't really do anything for you. That being said, I think the right call here, Caden, is you evaluate your team, build your team, uh, operate as if those picks, they're gone. It, it's whatever to Houston. And so if that, if you need to hit reset and you want to trade everyone, including Simmons and, and uh, like accumulate all these other picks from other teams, I'm totally fine uh, with them going that route. But I would like to see if we do get um, Kyrie Irving, Kevin Durant trades. I just want to see what a team looks like when it's sort of built around Ben Simmons. Can we get fuck ton of shooting around Ben Simmons? I don't think that that's going to be as nearly as effective as some people think. The Giannis comparisons are always absolutely terrible, but I still think Simmons is a damn good NBA player. He's he's a fantastic all world defender, and he's he's an all world passer as well. And so if you put the ball in his hands and everyone else around him is sort of supplementary, you're dealing with uh, just a lot of good floor spacers. There might be something to that. And then because, yeah, there's there's really no like virtue in getting these lower level playoff berths or sneaking into the play-in. But if you're getting these other picks that you're holding onto from other teams, that's how you get your bites at the draft apple in. I will say, if Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving are gone this upcoming year, uh, unless they're getting like Jalen Brown or Brandon Ingram back, uh, or just someone else that we're not talking about, I think that they need to go for the one-year tank and then sort of try to reboot things quicker in 23, 24. That's a really good question, though, Caden. Uh, Mo Haydespair asks, what's a better shot, a top-of-the-arc three or a free-throw line mid-ranger? I think context is important here. If you're telling me is it just a foul shot when the whistle's dead, the ball's dead, yeah, it's the foul shot. But I, I think it's just universally you're going to say the above-the-break three-pointer. And it could it, it, it depends on who's taking the shot, it depends on the context of the shot, but look, the league average on above the break threes was 1.047 points per shot this year. On From 15 feet out this season, the average was 0.818 points per shot, and 15 feet's about the distance of the free throw line to the rim. On just long mid-rangers, so if you want to expand past the free throw line a little bit, the average was 0.8.2 points per shot. And I think what we're learning is that the types of shots you're taking um, – are directly the result of the the floor geometry. And so when you're taking an above the break three pointer, you're most likely opening the floor more because you can, it's not necessarily this off the dribble difficult look. Uh, it's you can be at a standstill there. If you're at a standstill on the free throw line, I don't know what type of defense is like going to like that's going to be effective against. And that's sort of when we talk about, no, the mid range isn't dead. If you're saying a self created look that ends up being wide open from the foul line jumper, there are certain players if it's like DeMar DeRozan, maybe Chris Paul, that you prefer that over a catch and shoot above the break three or a pull up above the break three. I still think for the most part, it's the uh, a top of the arc three, whatever you want to call it, or an above the break three, just because there are more options there. You're not going to get catch and shoot jumpers from the foul line. And if you are, I'm going to question how your offense is being run for sure. Um, let's wrap things up with this fun question from FNF Devin. Should I put all my money on one spot at the roulette table or save up for a house? You guys think that I won't answer these, these joke questions that are maybe trolling us. You should absolutely put all your money on the roulette table because you can double up. And where else are you going to get 100% of your investment back? Think about how long it's going to take you to save up for a house, especially in this housing market. I'm fucking kidding. Please save up for a house. Save in general. Do not put all your money on the one spot in the roulette table. Um, that would just be an absolute nightmare. And also, as I'm kind of looking at this clock, I have time for at least one more question. So let's get to this from Chris Curtis on YouTube. Love the show in the mailbag. You're the man. Thank you, Chris. Uh, if you got to change a decision the Knicks have made in the past decade, what would it be? As a Suns fan, it's pretty easy that my do-over would be selecting Luka number one, but a strong honorable mention would have been taking Tyrese Halliburton over Jalen Smith. Yeah, that one stung. I'm not going to lie. Um, that's a great... That's a great question, Chris. For the Knicks specifically, I can't even pick they should have amnestied Amari Stoudemire because that's more than a decade away at this point. I might just like point to one of the, the draft routes not taken. Uh, what if they had gone with Shea Gilgis-Alexander instead of Kevin Knox in that draft? What does the trajectory of this uh, franchise look like if they go that route? I think, look, Fans aren't going to be wondering this as much either. And I don't think this needs to be the biggest do over because I still have hope. Um, and he's been very good in limited minutes, but just like 
What if instead of Obi Toppin, you went with Tyrese Halliburton? Would sort of be a fun one. So I'm trying to lean more more recent here. And there are a bunch of other draft decisions from the Knicks we could relitigate. They've by and large drafted pretty well uh, when they've been like, uh, especially like with their later first round picks um, in recent years. But I think it would be just because I'm so high on Shea Gilders Alexander and I view him as this all NBA player. When is the last time that the Knicks had that player consistently level of player uh, at the one or, or the two spot, really. I think if you hope that RJ Barrett turns into the all NBA type player to two, Shea Gilders Alexander can be more of the engine of an offense. And so um, that Kevin Knox, I think it's easy to zero in on that too, just because uh, Kevin Knox went all the way bust and it doesn't even have to be Shea. Like I might've, you would have rather have had Michael Porter jr. Than Kevin Knox, even with his injuries. Um, you certainly Mikhail Bridges, of course uh, that draft, it felt like there were a, a lot of options. And sometimes I feel like the Knicks have, overthought it when they're higher up. And yeah, when it's a no brainer pick or again, the value they've mined out of the later rounds of the draft. Uh, but sometimes it's just like, Hey, you've needed a primary ball handler facilitator, whatever, like pole star for your offense. Just take the player that has a chance in hell of becoming that rather than outsmarting yourself with, Oh, look at the talent of Kevin Knox where, yeah, he had a good summer league, but was wildly inefficient. I don't think anyone actually thought he was going to be a primary offensive engine at the time. And so that's the one that sticks with me. I don't know if I'm living Knicks fans. If you're listening, fellow Knicks fans, uh, I don't know if that's like too recent, but the Shea Gilders Alexander miss still stings a lot for me. And like, if we're able to redo uh, like history with ping pong balls, then yeah, it would be nice if they won the Zion Williamson draft or the Carl Anthony Towns draft. But I'm, I'm looking at it from decisions that they could uh, probably control. And no, if you're asking, do I, why don't I focus on the Donovan Mitchell draft and why could they drafted Frank Nielakina? I won't go there because Frank Nielakina is an all time great. This was a lot of fun. I'm actually proud of myself for doing this in under very well under an hour. Uh, please remember to rate review and subscribe to the podcast, wherever you're consuming it, hit that subscribe button on YouTube, tell your friends, family members, acquaintances, random people on the internet about us. Uh, please. As always though, remember to never leave this podcast before giving a shout out to the one the only, the regret that I will never have for the Knicks taking him at number eight, Frank Nielakina. <laughs> <laughs>